Good morning, Mr. Reardon. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court, Theodore Reardon on behalf of the defendant, Mr. Avalos. Your Honors, the issue in this case is whether or not the defendant's uh, Sixth Amendment and Article 12 rights to cross-examine witnesses were improperly curtailed. So you, you do not see the issue, I would tend to agree with you, you do not see any rape shield uh, statute issue in this case. I, I mean, that's been, you didn't raise it, the judge didn't raise it, nobody raised it. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay, I have a question. Why was the statement, am I correct, first of all, that the victim's statement in the diary, yes, I was sexually abused, that was admitted in evidence? Um, yes, it was. Okay, why? Um, well, actually, that that exact language was elicited by the defendant in cross-examination. Um, the Commonwealth, in its examination of the witness, asked um, the um, uh, alleged victim in this case, um, what happened when you came home one day? Well, my mother confronted me with a diary. Well, what happened next? Well, I threw up, and then we went to the police. So what exactly was said or read in the diary did not come out in the Commonwealth's direct examination. And the Commonwealth didn't, did not object, I suppose they did not object when you asked about that statement, yes, I was sexually abused? Correct, yes. Did, did, I mean, ordinarily that just wouldn't, it seems to me, it wouldn't be admissible. Didn't it actually come in through the Commonwealth on redirect? Um, uh, the Commonwealth also asked about it on redirect, but it first came out on the defendant's cross-examination. You, you understand that CPCS has taken the position that that should not have been admissible, so all I'm trying to reach to do we now have this and then have an ineffective assistance of counsel claim the next go around? Well, I'm sorry, so what's your question? So my question is, you have, you're not objecting to it here, correct? Well, the statement itself was elicited by the defense in cross-examination. The, the amicus does make a good point. Um, there was a case decided by this court um, about four to five days before I filed my brief in which this, co this court held that the Commonwealth should not uh, be allowed to introduce into evidence. Stuck it. Um, I'm sorry? Stuck it. Stuck it. Correct. Yes, yes, exactly. And did you, did you, but you haven't pursued the point. But, 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 this, but the admissibility of the statement, yes, I was sexually abused, is written in the diary, doesn't depend on stoppage. It's nothing, it just simply isn't admissible, what somebody said before in a writing. Well, yes, but I, mean, I think. Unless, you're, unless for specific limited purposes, prior inconsistent or prior consistent. But so it, it wasn't admissible. It has nothing to do with um, first complaint, nothing to do with anything else. Yes, Your Honor. Um, but the point that the court. Is that the defense elicited it, and the Commonwealth, of course, didn't object. I, I take it the defense elicited it because they, the, the um, uh, counsel, and I understand it was not you, uh, wanted to be able to pursue the, the, the fact that the mother was more upset about what was said about her than this reference to sex, sexual abuse, correct? Yes, yes. And that well, uh, had went to the defendant's theory that this was all a fabrication. That, but then um, the judge refused to admit that evidence. Yes. Wouldn't careful counsel have... I mean, I know that there was a motion in Lemonet. I know that, that she said no, but you can raise it again at trial. Isn't this going down a pretty um, risky path? In other words, to, to solicit this information in the hope that you will be able to question further about other pieces of the diary when you don't yet have a ruling, isn't that pretty risky? Well, I think at this point, there was already ruling by the judge that she was not going to allow in all this other, um, anything else other than the one statement. Right, um, well, that's what I'm asking about. On what basis did the judge say that she would let in the statement, yes, I was sexually abused? Um, it was a motion to eliminate, correct, in which the Commonwealth yes. saw admission of the statement, right. And the judge says, yes, it can come in. Why? Well, I think the Commonwealth was asking for it to come in in order to, quote, set the stage as far as what brought the allegation um, to the, to the I, police. I've read the, the motion in Lemonade that's a, it's at the back of your brief, maybe, somebody's brief, any anyway. event. It, it seems to be that the thrust of that motion by the Commonwealth is arguing why lots of other references in that diary should not come in. I didn't actually see a request to put in that, that reference on page 189, but that, that in, and we, unfortunately, we didn't get the transcript of the motion in Lemonade hearing. We oh. will, but we don't have it yet. So is, is, but you say the Commonwealth actually sought to have that in the motion in limine, sought to have that introduced? It, the, yes, the sexual abuse uh, reference, yes. Okay. Yes. So the, the, the defendant's primary theory actually had nothing to do with any of this. It had to do with the fact 
that um, uh, the defendant's theory was that Nat Natasha and Diane were biased because the defendant had um, left um, their mo grandmother, mother respectively. Um, and did the defense make clear to the judge that that was their theory of the case? Um, well, on, on the motion in limine, um, the motion, the motion in limine didn't concern this first theory. No, but when you were arguing different objections and why different statements should come in, did you at least at some point make it clear to the judge that that was your theory? At trial, absolutely, yes. When the defendant sought to introduce these um, statements, he, she was, he made it very clear that um, the issue in this case is that these witnesses were biased against um, the defendant because the defendant had left their mother slash grandmother respectively. Um, weeks before this allegation came about and that and that he wanted to inquire about them what did you know about their separation what did you know about the circumstances of why they left one another um, what did you know about the, the divorce and the judge precluded him uh, from asking any of those questions of the witnesses and it directly goes to their bias um, and the allegation that this was a fabrication um, where the, the second defense comes into play where um, uh, the de uh, defense counsel wanted to get into evidence that the other statements in, in the diary, that um, the daughter hated the mother because she had been physically abused. He wanted to get in the entire circumstances of this confrontation between the mother and the daughter in the diary. Um, the, the theory being that the mother admitted by her own testimony that she was much more concerned with all the other things in the diary than the sexual abuse allegation. Yes, but if the, mother, the mother's upset about the why would that induce in the child a false accusation against the defendant? Well, because the diary itself doesn't name, name the alleged perpetrator. And the thought was that the daughter knew of the, bi the mother's bias and hatred towards the defendant because he had left her by his mother, um, and that she was taking advantage of that when placed in this uncomfortable confrontation in naming the defendant um, as the perpetrator of the sexual abuse. So thereby taking attention away from herself. Exactly. C could I ask you this, though? Um, in your brief, you, you sort of rely on the fact that when the daughter denied knowing anything about why the grandparents split up um, and the mother said something that she, you know, she, she, she continued to like the defendant. And, and basically you say, that's incredible. But I, I guess my question is, what, was there any factual basis for the defense to pursue the idea that, um, um, let me start with the daughter, that the daughter knew of the mother's feelings about the defendant, that's number one, uh, and that, I, I take, I guess there is a basis for the mother's feelings because the defendant testified that the mother was trying to, was interfering with the marriage, right? Yes. So, the, so, the, uh, so what's the answer to the first question? Well, the, um, that the daughter know that the mother, forget about the circumstances, but that the mother uh, was hostile. Is there evidence in the record that the daughter knew that the, the mother um, maintained sense of feeling of hostility? Well, there isn't, because the, the, the Commonwealth objected and the, uh, the question was asked, but the Commonwealth objected and, the, and asked of? Asked of both. Um, of the daughter? Yes, and the mother. And the didn't mother. the daughter answer she didn't know? Um, on, one, on one point she said, um, I don't know, but then um, they were asked further questions of what did you know about the relationship and whatnot. And did they make offers of proof on that? Um, the, uh, the on the hostility? Um, no, no. But the judge preclu pre completely precluded the defendant from pursuing any of this, and it's quite obvious by the sidebars that when the um, defense tried to ask for a sidebar on one occasion, the judge said no, and on another occasion, um, the, the defense counsel tried to discuss the, uh, the nature of the uh, Commonwealth's objection, and the judge said no, if you want to make an offer of proof, go ahead. Um, and it wasn't a factual offer of proof, it was a legal theory offer of proof that I'm offering this to show that there was a bias and that the um, daughter took um, advantage of this bias by falsely identifying the defendant. Um, but in, you know, in, in regards, I think it's important to note the daughter's age in this case. Um, at the time of trial, she was in the 11th grade. At the time of the um, alleged um, uh, abuse, she was uh, much younger. And uh, how old was she when she was writing her diary? Well, the evidence on that is that um, she received the diary 
um, at about age 12 or 13, and it was about um, a year after the last alleged abuse. So I would suggest to you that an 11th grader, um, maybe, you know, maybe so, not someone younger, but at least an 11th grader, um, would have an awareness about what's going on with a, a grandparent's divorce and that it isn't so far-fetched that defense counsel asked that question, what did you know about your grandparent's divorce? Well, when, when was the um, confrontation about the, the, the diary was, was when she was a, the spring of her freshman year? Yes. Is that right? Yes. So she was 14? Um, well, she was, she was 11th grade and 16 at the time of trial, and the trial took place in the fall. I forget when her birthday was, June, I believe, or something like that, right? So, so that's when the, that's when she, when are you saying she should have known about the, about the uh, grandparents' relationship? Breaking up? Um, well, it would be at the time of the confrontation in the diary, which would be in the spring of her um, freshman year, which she's probably 15, about there. The um, evidence of the um, disclosure that she made to her friend? Yes. W what was the substance of that? Um, the substance of it was that they were in the uh, school bathroom, and the friend had said um, that she had been abused. And um, the girl, in this case, um, said, oh, I was too. And that was about the gist of it. Naming this defendant? No. No, she did not name the defendant. I haven't looked at the diary, obviously. Uh, in other parts of the diary, does she name people? No. Except the mother. Yes. On various and, and I take it this is a this is a diary. It's not a diary in the sense. It's it's a it's a questionnaire in a book form. Correct. Yes. 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 Um, well. So l let me ask you this: Are you? Um, I guess two questions. Did, did before trial, did the defendant move to admit portions of the diary? Um, no. Okay. Um, but it was the defendant's. I guess what I'm trying to get at is this: if the Commonwealth hadn't sought to introduce this um, one entry, was was. Was the defense going to just not get into the diary at all, or was it was part of the defense that that he wanted to raise the diary? Um, he, he he wanted to raise um, these other aspects of the diary to go and show that this was a fabrication because there were so many other things in the diary that were more concerning to the mother. It also went to the defendant's theory that, frankly, maybe the mother didn't believe so, the so abuse the allegations. Trial theory was. Regardless of what the Commonwealth did or didn't want to do with the diary, he wanted to introduce portions of it, or at least question the um, the complainant about it. Is yes. that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. If there are no other questions, Your Honors, I'll rest of my brief. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Thank you. Lee. Good morning. May it please the court, my name is Macy Lee. I'm an assistant district attorney. And with me at council table is Leora Joseph. On what basis did you um, file your motion in limine to admit the statement in the diary that the um, complainant had said she had been sexually abused? Actually, the Commonwealth uh, filed a motion in limine to preclude the admittance of any uh, reference of any of the okay, contents in the diary. I thought the motion in limine was to preclude any references from the diary except for that statement. That's incorrect, Your Honor. Everything. It's to preclude everything. In fact, if you look at page 17 of the defendant's record appendix, the first full paragraph specifically states very clearly that the Commonwealth wishes to preclude any questionings regarding the omissions of any references by the defendant of the alleged abuse, including the question of whether or not the victim was ever sexually abused. So, so yes, during the motion in limine hearing, did the judge say, I'm going to admit page 189 but nothing else or did that just not come up? It did come up, Your Honor. Um, actually, what had happened, it was a non-evidentiary hearing and during the motion in limine uh, after a hearing between counsel, the trial judge ruled that the question of whether or not any sexual abuse occurred and the answer yes can only be used by the defendant during opening statement and any other references concerning this statement or any other contents of the diary 
are to be approached during, um, at sidebar um, in discussion by the, with what, the judge. What, what do you understand she was doing? The judge. The judge, my understanding is um, that she was going to allow the statement in during opening so the jury could know, and I'm guessing here, that the case is now in court. Isn't because an opening statement though supposed to be the evidence that one expects, anticipates, will be admiss admissible? And if there's already been a ruling that the diary isn't admissible? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Um, it, it, what the judge, uh, the trial judge, to say is that um, that the only portion that would be allowed during opening is that um, there's no mention in the diary with the exception of the one line, have you ever been sexually abused? Yes, in the opening statement. That's the exact order on page 35. And if the court doesn't have a copy of the uh, transcript, I'd be happy to provide copies this yeah, afternoon. She, so she said that to the defendant. You can, you can argue in your, I mean, you can say in your opening that this one entry? Uh, yes, and she also further rules that um, it seems to me that whether she thinks of herself as a flirt or as a liar, or what she wants with respect to her boyfriend and her position with respect to her mother, that it's in the diary is not germane to any issue before the jury. But so I, I go back to my question. What yes. on earth was the judge doing? In, in, in fairness, I assume that it was the intent of the prosecutor to offer the victim's testimony that the mother told her that she had read the diary and then she disclosed the the abuse, correct? I think the, uh, the intention of the trial prosecutor was that the mother found the diary while unpacking boxes after moving from Malden. And when she discovered this diary, this is what motivated the complaint against the defendant. This is what motivated a meeting with the district attorney's office. And this is why, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we are here today on this case. Right, so and so it's basically essentially setting the foundation. So if, if that statement did not come in, the jury would not be told what the content of the diary was, but would probably understand that it may have been worse even than it turned out to be. Perhaps, um, but again, I would uh, assume that there would be limiting instructions by the, the trial judge um, to not speculate as to what the contents of the diary would be. Um, but again, the, the contents did come in. Um, in fact, um, many uh, various contents of the diary did come in to, in the defense attempt to show bias, uh, the relationship between the victim and her mother, and as well as any possible motivations to lie on behalf of the defendant. Did the uh, Commonwealth take the position uh, at the uh, hearing on the motion in limiting that uh, it, it, it did not want that statement in the diary to be considered its first complaint. Yes, that, be, I, I, that became clear, um, that the first complaint was a, a school friend named Andrea um, during the that, a little short discussion in the bathroom. And, that, that and that's why the Commonwealth could not use that statement. That's correct. Um, but again, uh, the statement did come in because during cross-examination of the victim, the defense made numerous attempts uh, to divulge, to, to, uh, to bring up the contents of the diary. Um, and then it was only on redirect, the Commonwealth then asked specifically of the victim what the question was and what her answer was. So on, on cross-examination, did that reference come in? Or did um, yes, it did. Uh, on cross-examination, the defendant specifically asked her directly, um, in fact, he marked um, the diary, which is a chicken soup for the teenage soul, as Exhibit right. A. Yeah. He marked it um, and then questioned the victim precisely about the question of whether she was sexually abused and whether she was physically abused. Why did she answer one question in pen? Why did she answer the other one in pencil? Um, and, and when did she answer these questions? Did she answer them at the same time or did she answer them some later time? So he actually did spend about a good 20 pages, if not more, cross-examining her on the question of sexual abuse and as well as physical abuse, um, tying in whether she had her feelings about her mother. Um, he made direct quotes from the diary, such as rude, crude, hateful, free as a bird. Uh, those were exact language that the victim used in the diary. Um, and again, uh, he, 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 he did that on cross-examination. So any, uh, any and all claims by the defendant that he was per not permitted to cross-examine the victim based on the contents of the diary are easily refuted by the record um, of this case. What about the claim that he was, <coughs> defense counsel was limited in connection with developing the complainant's knowledge of the breakup between the grandmother and the defendant? Well, I, why, why was that area not permitted? Again, um, that is incorrect. Uh, the defendant was um, allowed to cross-examine the victim on her knowledge about the relationship um, between her grandmother and the defendant. Um, just to give you a little background um, about the relationship, uh, the defendant and 
his wife, uh, the victim's grandmother, had moved to Florida to be closer to the defendants, um, I believe um, another family member. So they had already moved um, prior to some time um, before uh, this, mm -hmm. this diary was found. But during trial... Uh, had they moved before she disclosed to her yes. friend? Yes, yes. So the... I, I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure about that. I'm assuming yes, but I can't say uh, for sure in terms of the first, the, the, the first complaint um, and the defendant's move. But during, again, during trial, the defendant specifically asked, do you remember a time when Mr. the defendant went to Florida? Yes. And you at least at some point came to learn that the defendant went to Florida because he wanted to get away from the family and move down there, right? No. You never learned that. No. Your mother never told you. No. Your mother, your grandmother told you. No. Did your grandmother ever discuss the relationship with your grandfather at any time? Can you repeat that? And the question is repeated. Uh, yes. Question, yes. And when, sh did she, when did she first discuss with you anything in regard to relationship? Objection, when? Yes. Overruled. So he continues with this line of questioning. After they had split up when they came back. So there's, there's about a good four pages of discussion concerning the big... Is on? It is on volume 2, 100 to... 103 of uh, the transcript. So simply because the defendant did not elicit the desired answer from the victim, which would be uh, um, ideally for him, yes, I knew they separated. I did not like my grandfather. I, I, mo I was motivated to make false ac accusations against him concerning uh, these charges, but that didn't occur. So simply because it didn't occur does not mean that he was not permitted. Ms. Lee, could yes. I just move on to another subject, sure. which is a part of your brief that said that she properly limited uh, cross-examination of the victim under the rape shield statute. Was there any discussion at trial about the rape shield statute? There was at the motion in limine. Uh, there was, um, and you're referring to the motion in limine, uh, or no? Well, she she, pro she probably allowed the motion in limine. Yes. Yes. Um, inter at trial, was there any discussions of? of I'm sorry. I, I I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to explore your raising of the rape shield statute and, and how we should look at that in the context of this case. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in this case, uh, nothing that my reading of the record, nothing concerning contents that would be prohibited by the rape shield was actually admitted at trial. Um, that would include any references in the diary of desires to have boyfriends, boys liking her, flirting, why kissing. Is, why, why is that covered by the yeah, that's my question. Again, that would be covered by rape shield because that would, unless it affects her credibility in some way and it would have valuable impeachment purposes, which it wouldn't in this case, it would be eliminated because, again, for ch this, again, we're not dealing with an but adult how here. That, how, how does that fit with him? Yeah. Or reputation. Well, for a child, that may be sexual conduct. Cuddling, but kissing, flirting. But he doesn't have sexual conduct. I would argue that Wanting it would boyfriends? be that's sexual conduct? for a adolescent. Yes, that would that I would I would argue that that would include Wait. sexual conduct. Do we look to the statute? Is there language in the statute that will help us? Uh, uh, yes, I think 21B would be uh, instructive in terms of. But it doesn't say that. Uh, it doesn't, but I think that the term sexual conduct can include <coughs> for a young child, particularly maybe a, from a six to twelve year old, could include flirting, cuddling, desires, boyfriend. Again, that has something to do with her character. Um, and well, in any event, it doesn't get raised because there's nothing. That's well, it gets up. raised because <coughs> she excluded that, and the defendant wanted to introduce it. But not on that basis. I don't believe. I don't believe that uh, at the hearing in motion limine he that he wished to. In fact, he during the motion limine the uh, defendant uh, failed to articulate a theory as to why he wanted to raise any of these items that were listed in the diary. Um, and I believe that there was no issue in terms of the boyfriend, the kissing, the flirting. Um, her, her desire to, to be popular with boys, any of that um, was an issue at the motion in limine, in the hearing on the motion in limine. Unless the court has any further questions, the uh, Commonwealth rests on its brief. Thank, Thank you. you.